into the Old Testament today to 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning at verse 10, 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Amen. And the work which you stand with me today in honor of the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> the Word of God reads in this fashion. So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his house. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. I repeated that line for a second. I want you to understand something. The linen ephod was symbolic of the priestly office. It indicated the priestly office. David was acting in carrying the ark of God into the city of David. He was not acting as the king of Israel. He was acting as a priest. And as a priest, look at his behavior. He danced before the ark of the Lord with all his might. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Now the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. And Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David. Now I want to stop for a second. Do you see how Saul's daughter is looking at David? How did she see him? King David. But David was wearing a linen ephod. How was David bringing the ark in? As a king? No, as a priest. But she saw King David. She was looking at him in terms of his kingship, leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and they set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone, to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today! uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids and of his servants as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel, Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, 
and will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maid servants of whom you have spoken by them, I will be held in honor. Amen. I want to talk to us today about the ark within. The ark within. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we love you today. We thank you once again for this service. We thank you, God, for the wonderful presence of your spirit that we felt in this place so far. Lord, the word of God is about to go forth, and there is no more important part of the service than the preaching of the word of God. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Lord, you've given me a word of exhortation that it might uplift hearts and help souls to be encouraged. And I ask God that your many great, wonderful anointing might rest upon me this hour. God, that your word might go forth and bring about the, uh, the end that you would desire to be all about. God, let not one word be wasted. And let not one thought, Lord, be spared. But give us all today that you have for us to hear. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. The ark of God has been out of the possession of the people of Israel for some time. It had not rested in the city of David for quite a number of years. The ark of the Lord was one of the greatest possessions that Israel could ever have because God himself spoke to the children of Israel and gave them very specific instructions as to how that ark was to be built. If you remember God, gave another man instructions that were very specific one day in how to build something that was called an ark. And that man's name was Noah. Amen. And were it not for Noah obeying God and doing what God had told him to do exactly the way God had told him to do it, We have no humanity today, for all of humanity would have been lost in the flood. But Noah's faith and his obedience allowed for you and I to be here right now. Amen. So you see, when God tells folks that he wants something done, it's a good idea to do it his way. It's a good idea to follow his direction. But the reason that God gave the children of Israel such explicit directions as to how the Ark of the Covenant was to be built, what it was to be made of, what it was to look like, was because the Ark of the Covenant was going to serve one of the most important functions of any piece of furniture built by human hands in all of time and eternity. For the Ark of the Covenant at the very top had angels that faced opposite one another and their wings came back. People say, do angels have wings? Well, obviously some do because God told them to put angels with wings on the Ark. Amen. So there must be some of them have wings anyway. And their wings would come together and where the wings touched at the center like this, it was virtually perfectly flat, the wings. And atop those wings was called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat, God said, that's where I am. And in the tabernacle that the children of Israel built, you remember we spoke last time about the curtain that separated, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies. Well, guess what was behind the Holy of Holies? The Ark of the Covenant was there. And guess what? God's very presence and power and glory were in that place because God himself declared, I will set on the mercy seat. For he was Israel's king, and that was his throne, sitting on the wings of the angels. 
the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant, they were given very specific instructions as to how to handle the Ark. There were rings at the corners of the Ark, and four priests were required to slide holes through those rings, never touching the Ark. You do not dare touch the Ark. But you slide the pole through the rings, and then one priest on that end, one on this end, one at the front, and one on the other side would bear it up upon their shoulders. And they would carry the ark wherever it needed to go upon the shoulder of four priests. But David decided at one point, I'm going to go retrieve the ark. I'm going to bring it back into the city of David. I'm tired of it not being where it belongs. I'm tired of God's presence not being where it belongs. Have you ever missed the presence of God? Have you ever been outside of church or outside of the fellowship of God's people and finally come to the place where you say, one way or another, I'm going to find the presence of God. I'm tired of being outside the loop. Hallelujah. Well, that's how David said, he said, I'm going to put the ark where it belongs, in the capital city of this great nation. I'm going to put it where it belongs. I'm going to bring it back to the city of David. So the ark of the covenant was placed carelessly and thoughtlessly upon the back of a cart that was pulled by an oxen, as if it were nothing more than a crate or a box, or maybe chickens going to the market, or possibly some hay that's being taken out to the field. And the ark was started its journey into the city of David on the back of this cart. And at one place, it hit a little bit of a rut in the road, and the scripture said it began to kind of rock a little bit. And when it did, the ark almost looked like it might slip off. And one man leaped forward thinking he was doing right, and he pushed the ark with his hands, and as he did, the Bible said that he was struck dead right there beside the cart. And then David was scared. He said, well, maybe I don't want the ark in the city of David after all. And he decided in our reading today, he had decided to put it in the house of Obed-Edom instead. He said, let's put it over here. Let's let his town have it. Let's let his people have it. Because Lord have mercy. If somebody touching it is going to cause somebody to get killed, then maybe it's better we don't even have it. David i got news for you, honey. When God tells you how to do something, do it God's way. Amen. The problem there wasn't that the, the, the ark was a bad thing or a scary thing. The problem there was that you had taken the presence of God for granted. And rather than giving God the honor and the glory that was due Him, you took the very piece of furniture, as it were, that he had had the people of Israel create to represent his presence and put it up on an old ox cart, a new ox cart actually, but up on a new ox cart as though it were nothing more than an object. Anything annoys the fire out of me more, seeing the Spirit of the Lord moving in a church service. I mean, just having a good Holy Ghost time and some people sitting around talking and jacking jaws and carrying on and taking the presence of God for granted. Amen. You don't do that. You reverence the move of God. If you're not in the spirit about things, that's all well and good. But honey, you can be in a spirit of prayer. You can be in an attitude of prayer. But don't you be sitting there disrespecting the move of God and, and the power of God by carrying on and acting foolish and jacking your jaws. That's, that's inappropriate. It's wrong. And this is the very attitude that wound up costing 
this man in the scripture his life because he took for granted the presence of God. We don't know how many more days we have in this life that the presence of God is going to be able to fall in our churches and we're going to be able to shout the way we do and have church the way we do. We don't know that before too long the Antichrist is going to appear on the scene and the Christian church is suddenly going to fall under the heat of deep persecution and we're going to have to go underground. We don't know. So children, don't you take for granted the presence of God. It's a wonderful thing. You see, there are a lot of people that aren't in church today that could be. And it's simply because they take the church for granted. They take for granted that it will be there when they need it. When I'm in the mood to go, I'll go. When I need church, I'll go to church. I've got news for you. It may not be here then. You cannot take the presence of God for granted. Amen. David carried the Ark of the Covenant back into the city of David when, after he had heard about how blessed the house of Obed-Edom was, all of a sudden David began to see the Ark in a different light. And he began to look upon it differently and he realized, you know what we do? Yes, we do indeed need this back. We do indeed need this in the city of David. And suddenly, David made preparations to move the ark a second time. But this time, David had a much greater sense of appreciation. This time, David had a much greater sense of awe. This time, David had a much more somber sense of the presence of God that was revealed and represented in the Ark of the Covenant. And all of a sudden, David took a different mindset. And as they began to bring the Ark of the Covenant of God into the city of David, David began to worship God in a physical manner that was greater, that was much more of uh, required much more energy than anything he had ever done before. He began to leap and praise God and dance in front of the earth. And he just began to leap and run. And my God, he couldn't stand the heat of his body. And off came the clothes. Oh God, give us people that would sooner take off their clothes than stop worshiping. Amen. Well, I was worshiping the Lord till it got hot. Well, I haven't gone to church, but I understand their conditions, folks. Come on now. A lot of people, that's the way they do. David said, that's all right, I'll just wear light pants and a tank top if I have to, but I'm going to church. I'll just tear my clothes off if I have to. I won't wear my robe, but I'm going to dance. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to celebrate. What did David have to celebrate? What did David have to rejoice over? The presence of God was coming back into the city of David. He finally realized it was not the earth. It was the presence he should be celebrating. <laughs> Hallelujah. And David began to think about all the blessing that comes with the presence of God. And he just could not control himself. He lost himself in the excitement of the hour. Some people don't like the way that we Pentecostal folks worship. They don't like it when we get happy. They don't like it when people begin to dance in the aisles. They don't like it when people begin to run and leap and rejoice in the presence and power of God. Well, I've got news for you. I have the earth within me. Hallelujah! In the Old Testament, the ark was behind the veil. Today, the ark is in me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The Bible tells us many, many times throughout the New Testament that the promise of the indwelling, infilling of the Holy Ghost, 
was something that God had designed from the beginning of time. Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, John the Baptist said, that he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Mark chapter 1 and 8, the Apostle Mark records John the Baptist as saying, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Luke chapter 3, verse 16, John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. John chapter 1, verse 33. John again is speaking, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same sent unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, in James Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Not only do we have unencumbered access to the Holy of Holies, listen to this now, but we no longer have to go to God God has come to us. In the infilling and indwelling of the Holy Ghost, God puts His ark in us. He puts His presence in us. He puts His power in us. All the things that were represented by the ark of the covenant, God has put in you. And why do you think the word of God issues the Lord? Touch not mine anointed, nor do my prophet any harm. Because when you touch a child of God, you're touching a possessor of the ark. And you better watch yourself. The Lord has said in Jeremiah 22, verses 23 and 24, Am I a God at hand? Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Am I a God afar off? No, I'm not a God afar off. God trying to say, I'm right there with you the whole time. Hallelujah. In Psalm 16, verse 11, David, listen to what this man has to say. The man who finally came to appreciate, who came to uh, understand the presence of God and what the ark of the Lord represented in the presence of God. And suddenly David writes in Psalm 16, verse 11, You will show me the path of life in your presence this fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David says, Lord, when I'm in your presence, there isn't an ounce of joy that escapes me. We wonder why. I can't wait till the day we got 300 people tearing through this place shouting. I can't wait. And people wonder how, us Pentecostal folks, how come y'all have church that way? Because in your presence, there is fullness of joy. You can lose a relative. You can be going through hell on wheels. You can have a husband that beats you. Come on now. You can have a partner that drinks and, and you can be struggling with all the problems of life but in the presence of God all those things melt away and all that remains is fullness of joy and suddenly you begin to see the same level of rejoicing and celebrating that David did that day 
they bring in the ark in the presence of God back in to the city of David. You see that? I remember at Riverside Church of God, and I remember Sister Prince had a husband that treated her miserably, a horrible drunk, had a terrible life, a difficult time. But oh, when she came into the house of God, and the presence of the Lord came down, oh, she shouted about it. Hallelujah. She cried, oh, my God. She got to the aisle because in the presence of God is fullness of joy. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Got people out there trying to drink themselves happy. Got people out there shoving needles into their arms, smoking these funny little pipes because there's so much misery and unhappiness on the inside that they can't deal with in their human capacity. And all the while I have the answer. <laughs> Just to come and know the presence of God. Do you know the Teen Challenge, which is the organization David Wilkerson founded almost 40 years ago? Teen Challenge has a program for, for young people who are hooked on drugs and alcohol, gang members, people who are in some awful, tough lives. And they've had, they started the program in New York City. It's all over the world now. They've got it in major cities all over the world. And they have a, something in the neighborhood of a 98% success rate. That means out of all the people that ever come through that program, 2% go back to the drugs or alcohol. Now the U.S. government has funded programs over the years, and I've seen the statistics on it. And they say that the best success rate they have is about a 20% first-time success rate. They went to Team Challenge. They said, what are you doing? There's got to be something going on here. <laughs> they look at and said, there is. We pray these people through to the Holy Ghost. And in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. When you get the presence of God in your life, and you get the power of God in your life, he said all of a sudden, honey, the drugs couldn't even begin to compare. They couldn't even begin to appeal to you anymore. They said, well, we can't do that. You know, separation of church and state and all. We can't preach the Holy Ghost baptism. And David Wilkerson says, that's all right, we will. We will. Amen. And we'll keep being successful where you keep failing. You don't have to say a word about it. We'll just keep doing what we're doing for those that come to us. But you see, children today, in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. When something's full, what does that mean? There ain't room for no more. See, I've had the Holy Ghost since I was a kid. I remember coming to the altar, Reverend Kautz. I don't remember his first name. He was a, his name was German, Kautz. was preaching a revival for us. I went into the altar about six years old. God filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I spoke with other tongues for the first time. I remember it. I remember vividly remember it at the old church on Prospect Street, the old wooden church. And I've had the Holy Ghost a long time. And I had a father that was a miserable human being to have to live with. I want to tell you. But I had the presence of God in me. And in His presence, <laughs> there is fullness of joy. You'd be amazed what God can do. Do you know, in this lifetime, I have never smoked a joint. In this lifetime, I have never drunk a beer. In this lifetime, I have never one time gone out to get drunk. And I've been out of church. I've been out of church, but the church was never out of me. Because once the Holy Ghost comes, the Lord promised, He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. 
And even in my darkest hour, when I was outside of God's fellowship and I was outside of God's church, guess what, honey? God's church and His fellowship were not outside of me. My ex Jason used to, there were times that I'd be going through a hard time for whatever reason, and I'd say to him, I need to be alone with the Father, just let me be. And I went in the bedroom and I began to cry. And I began to pray and say, Lord, I don't, I don't know what to do. I need your help I, because even though I know you don't want me, even though I know you don't have any use for me, even though I know you, you don't want nothing to do with me, I need your help anyway. You're the only help I have. And all of a sudden, guess what would happen, Laura? The presence of God would come down into the room. And before too long, I'd be praying in the Spirit, just like I always had. And the Spirit of the Lord would be interceding for me. Woo! Glory! He'd be interceding for me. The Bible said when we pray in the Spirit, that that is the Holy Ghost interceding through us and for us. Hallelujah! The Spirit of God came down, and He began to intercede for me! And before too long, I had the victory over whatever it was I was struggling with. And I began to shout. And my God, I shout like I was in church. I, I couldn't help it. Because in His presence, there is fullness of joy. And I'll tell you, after a while, Jason didn't know what to say. He was born and raised Roman Catholic. The only time you heard noise like that was somebody being tortured to death. So. He didn't know what was happening. But you know what? After a couple of years of that, he sought out the presence of God for himself. He sought it out for himself. He said, you know what? Whatever Charles has got, I've got to get it. I've got to have it. And he began to go to an apostolic church in New York City. And he got it. He got it. I went nowhere in the room. He got it. You see, I'm trying to tell you the ark today is within. We don't have to go to the ark anymore to stand before the presence of God. The ark is within. When we come together as believers into the house of God, all we're doing is, is incorporating our faith as believers. We're bringing it together. But there's not a one of us that doesn't sit at home and listen to records or tapes or CDs and worship God and feel His presence. Amen? You know why? Because the presence of God is within. It's not about location. It's not about where you're at. Amen? The ark of God is within you. In, <clears throat> in Psalm chapter 51, David prays a prayer that we all ought to pray on a daily basis. Create in me a clean heart, verse 10 through 12. O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Cast me not away from thy presence. I'm going to tell you, there is no more horrifying a sense that a believer can feel than to be lying on your deathbed, experiencing all kinds of horrific things, some of them medication-induced, and some of them just your body doing tricks on you. As I was three years ago, and I could not feel God anywhere. It was horrifying. My whole life, I've always felt the presence of the Lord. And I did not feel the presence of the Lord near me to comfort me in that difficult time. I couldn't feel God for all the money in the world. David said, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Lord, whatever you do, don't let me have to go through those periods. Don't let me have to go through those experiences where I can't feel you and know that you're there. But you know, I used to tell the devil, I remember laying in that bed, and I would just tell the devil, Devil, I don't have to feel him to know he's here. He said he'd be here, so he's here. 
And I and I've been, I've, I remember many times just thinking, Jesus, I can't feel you, Lord, I cannot sense that you're here. But I know you've got to be, because you said you'd be here. So I'm just going to believe it and stand on it and trust it that you are. And children, I'm here today as proof that he was there. Amen. You see, it's not always about feeling. Sometimes it's about faith. But I'll tell you what. God wants us to understand that he wants every believer to be able to know his presence and to sense his presence. In Acts 16, verses 25 and 26, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Things happen when God's presence comes on the scene. Amen. And the Bible teaches that God inhabits the praises of his people. So when Paul and Silas begin to sing and to pray and worship God, the presence of God came down, and the presence of God does things that you can't even imagine are possible. Amen. And all the prisoners' stands were loose, not just Paul and Silas. You want to see your drunkard neighbor get saved? Filled with the Holy Ghost? You want to see that drug addict down the way? Just keep bringing the presence of God into your house. Come on now, because when God breaks the bands in your cell, he'll break the bands in the cell down the block as well. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm almost done today, I promise. We know the promise the Lord gave us for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Matthew chapter 18 and 20. We know that promise. He says, my presence will most certainly manifest itself when two or three of you come together in my name. But the ark of God is within you. We don't have to bring it in like David did. The ark of God is within. Hallelujah. We remember the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were, with, uh, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All the presence and the power of God came down into that upper room and filled the believers with his heart. Amen. But children, listen in verses uh, 12 through 18. Listen to the further manifestation of the presence of God. And they were all amazed, meaning the men of Jerusalem, that were not in the upper room, and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to me, hearken to my words, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and all my servants and all my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Sometimes when the presence of God comes down, it almost resembles a drunken stupor. <laughs> The people in the upper room, the men of Jerusalem, begin to laugh at them. Oh, they're drunk, bunch of drunks. Look at them. What must they have been doing to appear drunk? 
they heard them speaking in their own languages, that don't make me think anybody's drunk. They must have been good. They might have been laughing like a bunch of lunatics. I can tell you what I've seen happen in Pentecostal church services when the Spirit is really moving. I've seen people get to laughing and shouting and screaming and hooting and leaping and jumping around and dancing and running and all kinds of stuff. That looks like a drunken brawl. So I can only imagine, because if you notice, the Bible said Peter and the other 11 apostles began to speak and preach to answer these people's inquiry. Well, honey, there's over 120 in the upper room. What were the other 109 people doing? They're still probably having church. <laughs> I imagine they just having church. They're just having a good time, enjoying the presence of God, because in His presence is fullness of joy. The ark of the Lord had just been brought into them. So my friend, what do they need with worrying about all that? That's the apostle's job. Let them preach. Amen. I've seen the Spirit of the Lord fall while the preachers preaching, and people getting happy and getting filled with the Holy Ghost, and all kinds of things happening while the preachers preaching. Well, why not? Let him preach. That's his job. Eh? Let God do what he wants to do with him. Amen? Can't you just wait for the day when we get a whole bunch more folk up in here and we start seeing these great things happening on a regular basis around here? In Acts 4, verses 12 and 13, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved, Peter preached. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. When you've been in the presence of God, be not so quick to argue with you. Because they recognize there's something there. You know that those boys been with you. I remember them being with Jesus. I've had debates with doctors of theology and had them turn around saying, Well, where did you go to seminary? Well, I didn't. I hate to admit it, but I'm one of them unlearned and ignorant men that we read about. They say, Now don't tell me you haven't been to seminary, because I know you have. I can tell by the way you talk, I can tell by the things you know that you've been to seminary. Do you know God has spoken to me about the, the uh, specifics of, of original text in certain scriptures? I never had to look it up. The Lord told me. He said that word in Hebrew means thus and so. It does not mean this is not a proper translation. This is, this is a, not that it's a mistranslation, but it just doesn't translate it properly, you know, thoroughly. And the Lord has spoken to me over the years many, 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 many times. And then years later, I've gone and looked something up, and you know what? It's exactly what it was. Exactly what he told me. I can, I can verify it. By, I've got the books to show you that what it says is what it says, but the Lord told me that. I didn't need the book to tell me because the Lord told me. You see? And when you've got that presence of God in your life, let me tell you, there's a lot of folk that might want to stand in your way, but they don't bother. Because they know you've been with Jesus. They know you've been before the Lord. They know that you've spent time in the presence of the Master. Amen? You want to you wanna have a victorious Christian life? Amen. One of the things you need to do is come to church. That's part of the process. Amen. There are times that we don't feel so good, and we don't feel so grand spiritually, and we're kind of going through lumps and stumps and hard times. And when we come into the house of God and we bring in our collective faith, all of a sudden here comes the presence of God, and before too long, poof, we're right back where we were. Our joy is back. Come on now. Our victory is back. We're right back on track. And sometimes it's hard to find that when you're by yourself. But that's why the Bible says that the weaker ought to bear up, the stronger ought to bear up the weaker. When we come into the church, that's what happens. The stronger are picking up the weaker and helping to carry them through the victory. Helping them to reach the finish line. Amen? 
the ark within today. I dropped it. In Nehemiah, that's what I want to close with today. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, the word of the Lord said, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry for the joy, this is what Nehemiah said, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Where does the joy come from? In my presence is fullness of joy. Amen. You want to be a weak Christian? Stay out of the presence of God. I love these people that tell me, I don't have to go to church. I can worship at home. And my answer is, but do you? Do you? It's one thing to say I can do it. It's another thing to do it. Do you invite the presence of God into your home and into your life? And do you welcome the presence of God into your spirit uh, at home? Do you do it or don't you? Because I guarantee you, 90